Welcome to episode number 42 of Circles Off. I'm Rob Pizzola, joined by Johnny from Betstamp. What's going on? Nothing much. It's a fun day today in the office. Uh, we're ripping out the table games. This is uh, pool, ping pong. We've got uh, Jatoni, which is uh, foosball. You know, foosball for those. It's, an, it's a different game. It is. the. I believe the foosball tables have three defenders at the back, whereas the Jatoni tables have one defender with the angled and the, le- and the and the the legs of the guys go through the other end mm. in foosball. Yeah, so like some injury info that might different might table, completely different game. I would say, listen, it's similar in terms of the skill. Like, you know, if you're good at one, you're gonna be good at the other. But it's like the professionals in each. It's like a very different game. When I used to work at the score back in the day, we had a foosball table. The most frustrating thing about the foosball is that you can take like a very wayward shot that hits a, a corner defender and goes in. Whereas that can't happen on the Jatoni table, just hits the ramp and comes back into play. Those are extremely frustrating because you're always lining up your goalie. You're used to lining up your goalie and then it just hits randomly one of the other defenders at the back and bounces in. Yeah, tough, but it's been fun so far, Uh, you know, getting those games going. I always wanted an office with a bunch of table games, you know, ping pong table, most, most common, but you know, we're, we're, we just don't have air hockey. I think we're going to, we're going to have to pass on that for now. We will get to actual podcast topics in a second here, but it was very heated in the office today where one of our content writers has been playing Johnny. And Johnny is by far the best Jatoni player in the office. It's not close. And we have like a new recreational player who's been playing him, getting smoked. We play games up to five. He usually loses five nothing. But Johnny went on the record saying that he would beat him, well, Mark. Well, he, you would beat Mark 100,000 straight times in Jatoni, up to five. Yeah, so... <laughs> I would probably make it more than a hundred thousand times, <laughs> but for the simple, like we're never, we're not going to get a hundred thousand games in. So we can, we can do it just a tally, but hey, for everyone, like we, we, we love to debate this stuff. We have another debate, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, later with Luke in the form of, you know, we like to put challenges that might, you know, seem unrealistic things that you're never going to do in your life. Like, you know, can you catch a pass from this quarterback with this defender on you? Like how many times out of a hundred would you catch it or, how many times until you would catch one. So we kind of love to do that stuff. And it's all, uh, it's cool. Cause you see the thinking and the, and the way it's done. And then like, if you actually convert it back to probability, it's like, yeah, one in a hundred thousand sounds ridiculous, but like, it's just not going to happen. We argue about things that will never be settled. Like it never really can be. This Unlo- one can be, if he beats me once. Well, we're never going to play. Well, yes, if he beats you once, but say you win a thousand straight games this year, which is very possible. You're very likely going to extrapolate that. And be like, see, I beat you in a thousand straight games. I would beat you in a hundred thousand straight games. Of course. Because that's like, there's going to be no way to settle it. It's the same thing. Like the inner office debate we were talking about is one of our developers in house uh, actually defended AJ Brown in high school, I believe. Mm -hmm. Went up against him in high school for a little bit, got cooked, torched a bunch of times. But that evolved into an argument of, could any of us in the office tackle Derrick Henry one-on-one? To which like most of us are very realistic and said, no, absolutely not. He's going to run over us. But one person, Luke, one of our social media guys, he's adamant that he can take down Derrick Henry. He, he makes himself a minus 150. But let's save this combo to the end. If you guys are staying tuned, we're actually going to bring on Luke in a bit. Um, and we have a couple cool topics. So this will be a real, a real good one. We'll have Luke in, in person, and we can ask him straight up why he thinks he can tackle Derrick Henry at a favorite price, which is crazy. Because, I listen, I think there's probably a chance that you could tackle him, you know, everyone's human. And like, you know, you catch an edge, dive for the feet, you're going to trip him up, but uh, it's nowhere near, um, you know, a 50, 50 shot. If that's what I'm, if that's what I'm saying, like, I, I know the odds of me tackling him are probably like, you know, maybe one in eight to one in 15, somewhere in there. I think I would need 10 of myself to tackle Derrick Henry. Is this a strategy? Okay. Save it. We're saving. All right. This. We'll let's save get it. Into the, yeah. Let's get into the actual two topics, betting, two betting topics game. today. Um, the first one is going to be bankroll management, which we didn't cover three weeks ago because uh, the episode went a little bit long. So we're going to talk about bankroll management. And like Johnny said, the second half of the episode, we're going to bring Luke into the studio. For those who have the BetStab app downloaded, you can follow Luke in the marketplace. Just search lay it with Luke which is his username, which is hilarious, by the way. Uh, You can click the follow button there, follow all of his bets. Uh, But the reason that we're going to bring Luke in is he is very much a recreational better. Huge sports fan, but more of a casual better. And this was actually a listener suggestion 
of trying to incorporate some more recreational topics and bringing recreational people on and giving them some advice on how they can improve their craft. So what we're going to do with Luke is walk through how he bets on a daily basis, what his handicapping style is, when he places his bets, so on and so forth. And we're going to try to give him some advice to improve his craft. Will he listen? I have no idea. He might have it all figured out already. He can tackle Derrick Henry, could probably beat the books, but we'll bring Luke on in the second half and we'll figure that out. Okay, so we're going to start with the bankroll management topic. This one is is really like, you know, Rob put out a video on Twitter in terms of like hedging. And, uh, you know, some people, you know, loved it and some people are like hating it. You know, this is not how you hedge. This is this and this and this and this. Reality is um, we want to we want to make sure that the stuff we're suggesting is applicable to 99 or 99.9% of the people. So we'll go over some scenarios in which things may change. Uh, it really will be for that 0.1% of people who are doing this on such a high level that probably don't need this advice in which there will be a scenario in which what we're saying might not be the best advice. So we're catering this towards the vast, vast majority. And we'll go over some other solutions um, you know, for that 1% or 0.1%. So in general... I think uh, I'll, I'll give a quick intro on like what bankroll management is for those of you who guys who don't know at all or just beginner. And then Rob will go into kind of some of the strategies and we'll go back and forth here. So off the bat, bankroll management gets a lot of different terms. Like, you know, you're like, oh, what is it? It's this, it's this. Oh, it's how much you should bet. Other people say it's how much you should attribute to your to sports betting. Uh, you know, I've even heard people say that bankroll management is basically just your ability to make the most amount of money possible, which is, is not correct. So we'll give a quick example. In my opinion, and in the, the majority opinion, the, your bankroll is however much money you have assigned to your sports betting as a business. So if you have a house and your house is worth $500,000 um, and you know you might have, let's say it's fully paid off. If you are not planning to mortgage that house, if you lose all your money, then you should not be including that in your bankroll. However, if you are planning to mortgage or sell that house, if you lose all your money betting, to put that towards betting, then you can include that in your bankroll. So very simply put, it's all of the money that you are prepared to spend slash invest in a business and call that business sports betting. So with that being said, it doesn't have to be liquid money in my opinion. So you don't necessarily have to have $100,000 in cash in order to be able to allocate $100,000 to your bankroll. You may have 75,000 in cash and 25,000 in the form of uh, you know, equities that are in the stock market. But if push came to shove, you would liquidate those and put them towards your bankroll. So a lot of times this is dangerous. We'll start off the bat. We definitely don't want people to be betting with money they don't have. You always want to be allocating responsibly what you can afford to lose. However, this is a sharp betting podcast. What we are going to do is explain how to bankroll manage the money you do have or have assigned to sports betting. So first, when we say what is your bankroll, it's very clear to me. Um, it is all of the money you have accessible to your sports betting business. Therefore, you know, for the simplicity of this, I guess we can use, what do you want to use, 100K bankroll? Sure, we can do that. I mean, I, I think you nailed it right there with that explanation. And I think something that's very important in sports betting, and I want to get this across before we get into more of this topic, is that a lot of these uh, strategies that we talk about or just general sports betting concepts, they're going to apply differently to different people. It's going to depend on the individual, how they're consuming the information, what their risk appetite is, all these different scenarios. But I think as you described it there, it's a pretty good all-encompassing definition of what bankroll management is. Or of what, I guess, what your bankroll is, right? Exactly. So the management of it is basically now, how much can I bet? And this is the way I, I consider bankroll management is how much should I be betting on each bet, you know, based on a few different factors, which we'll get into. But your bankroll management is how much should I be betting? How much should I keep in play at all times? You know, if I've got 12 games for the day, should I be betting more or less than if I have one game for the day? Is it all related to just how confident I am in that play or what perceived edge I have? We'll get into all that for sure. Um, but I guess, Rob, you wanted to just start it off in terms of like the, the risk appetite. Yeah, for sure. So the first thing you're always going to do, like Johnny said, is you're going to determine what your bankroll is and the size of your bankroll. And that's going to depend on the individual. Like I said, it's going to depend on your life circumstances and your risk appetite. But ultimately, this needs to be money that you consider to be part of your gambling. So as Johnny said, you know, if your house is part of your bankroll, you have to be willing to sell your house. I'm not suggesting that anyone does this, by the way, but you have to be willing to do these things 
in order to place the size of bets that you're going to with that starting bankroll. If you don't want it to be part of your bankroll, separate it from the rest of your money, that's completely fine as well. There's a lot of people who just carve out a set amount of cash and they say, this is what I'm starting with. I'm starting with $1,000. I'm starting with $10,000. I'm starting with $100,000. And they just pick that figure. They separate it from everything else, all their other assets that they have. And that's what they roll with. So you're going to determine the size of your bankroll at first. There's no right or wrong way to go about this. Obviously, the bigger the bankroll that you're starting with, the more likely you are to be able to win larger amounts of money or lose larger amounts of money. The way that we're going to describe this um, and your bets are going to be based off of the size of your bankroll. So keep that in mind. And I will say the last thing we're going to get into this problem gaming is always a thing that we talk about in general. But if you're getting to a point where you would be uncomfortable losing the amount of money that you're going to set aside for your starting bankroll, then you should lower your starting bankroll. Plain and simple. Because there's very, very few realistic scenarios where you're going to lose your entire bankroll. Obviously, it happens to people. I'm not saying it doesn't. But you're, you're probably not going to lose the entire amount you set aside. With that said, if that's going to be something that drives you to you know, depression or anything that's going to hurt your mental state or your physical well-being, anything along those lines, pick a different starting amount. So that's where I would go with that. Um, again, completely up to you in terms of determining the size of your bankroll, how risky you want to be, but it's got to be an amount that you're comfortable with. Okay. So we've determined how big our, our starting bankroll is because we know we've gone through some factors. We've crunched the numbers. We've determined how much money we have. What's up next is you have to determine um, what I call your risk profile, but it, it's also your style of better. So, you know, are you in betting to make money? And this is a question that a lot of people need to ask themselves, right? Are you betting recreationally to have fun or are you betting to make money? Now, this is a real issue and it ties hand in hand with bankroll management. I'm, we're, gonna, we're definitely gonna get into why, but in my opinion, I see too many people, uh, or at least I won't say too many people, but I see a lot of people who try to bet for money, lose money because they are doing the wrong things and then transfer and say, oh, I'm, I'm just betting for fun right? You need to make a conscious decision. When you are starting to bet on sports, when you open up your first betting account, say to yourself, am I going to try to make money doing this? Or am I doing this so I can sweat action, have a couple, you know, beers with my buddies, watch the games, maybe win a hundred bucks one day, lose a hundred bucks the other day, be happy one day, be sad one day and just swing it and hope, hope I make money. But no, overall, I'm probably going to lose money. If that's the case, great. I would say, if that's the case, you don't need to bankroll manage. Now, a lot of people will say, ah, you should still be staking, whatever. At that point, your only rule of thumb is don't bet more than you could afford to lose and try not to obviously spiral out of hand and then get into problem gaming situations. If you know for sure you're in it for recreational purposes, then you don't need to really worry about varying bet sizes by the dollar or, you know, betting 97 on this and 103 on this, you can just flat bet hundred bucks. Okay. So that's the first one. And it's, it's very easy. But if you are in that first category where you are saying to yourself, this is my passion project. This is my side hustle. This is a thing I'd like to do. And I want to see if I can win money at this, which as we've talked about on this podcast multiple times is very, very possible and not even super difficult to be able to make some money from sports betting. Then you need to go ahead and follow certain practices to make sure that the amount of money you have set aside grows proportionally and that you do not go bust. As soon as you go bust, you start all over. It's very hard to move it back up. So we always preach for sure. The one of the keys to this game um, is not making the most amount of money possible. One of the small keys to this game that flies under the radar is not going bust mm -hmm. so that you can stay in the game longer and continually compound your edge. All right. So I'll hand it over to Rob, but that's off the bat. So step one, you got to determine how much money you have in terms of allocating it to sports betting. And number two, you have to allocate yourself as a certain category. Am I a rec or am I a pro better? Do I want to win money or am I okay losing? And obviously those two are the first steps. We'll hand it off to Rob for in terms of like, you know, staking sizes and we'll get into some more stuff. Right. So from there, you're going to choose a staking system and there's no right or wrong here. There's a lot of different ways you can go about it. And a lot of it is lent to the style of better that you are for someone who's able to quantify their edge as an example. So we refer to them as originators. We've talked about originators on the podcast before. These are people who are coming up with their own probabilities for games. It's a lot easier to do some sort of staking system where you can, you know, we'll get into it in a second, but uh, some sort of confidence level or even further than that Kelly criterion. But 
you want to determine what percentage of your bankroll you're going to wager on any one event. You don't really have to stick to this um, like like it's the gospel, for example. And also depending on how much you want to risk, anyone's standard unit size can be different. So someone who's more risk averse, for example, would probably be looking at some sort of wager that's relatively around one to 2% of their total bankroll. Whereas someone who has a higher risk appetite, maybe their average wager is a little bit higher than that. There are other factors involved as well. Like Johnny pointed out off the top, that includes volume. So if you're playing a lot more plays, versus someone who's playing one to two plays a day, that's going to adjust your staking system as well. But there's four that I can think of off the top of my head. Again, this is just kind of how I would lump in, uh, lump people into different buckets. But you have what's called a flat betting staking scenario, which is what Johnny said. You, you're, you're probably a recreational better. This is not something I would advise to anyone who's looking to win in the long run, but you can still be a recreational better and employ some sort of bankroll management to help you over time. And flat betting is exactly what it sounds like. You're just taking a standard unit size and that's what you're betting on everything. And if your bankroll goes up, you start with a $1,000 bankroll and it goes up to 1500, you're still betting the same amount of money regardless. It's just a pure flat betting strategy. The advantage to this, especially if you're a recreational better, is that you're not chasing losses for the most part, which is one of the biggest problems with someone who is casually betting on sports. You go on a losing streak of four or five games. You think you're going to try to win it all back, and all of a sudden you make bigger plays. So you start sticking to flat betting, finding the best price available to you. That's going to give you a decent chance in the long run of surviving. That's number one. The second is very similar, but rather than flat betting a certain amount, you do a percentage of bankroll for each play. So you say, my average bet is going to be 2% of my total bankroll. So if you're starting at a $1,000 bankroll, you're starting at a $20 bet. Now, as your bankroll grows or decreases, depending on your bets, you're still going to be betting 2% of that bankroll. So as you start to get higher, and maybe you're up 1,200, 1,300 bucks, 1,400, your bets are going to start to get larger because you're still betting the same percentage. As your bankroll goes down, your bets are going to get smaller. Again, to Johnny's point, this is going to prevent you from going bust in the long run. So if you do go through these bad stretches, you're lowering your bankroll or your your size betting during that time. Those are more of what I would call recreational staking systems. That's not to say I've never seen someone win flat betting or betting a flat percentage of their bankroll. It happens. People can win in the long run, but those are more recreational concepts. Then we get into a more a couple so, more advanced concepts. So let's go difference between flat betting and percentage of bankroll. Which one's better? So flat betting is easier, right? You're like, okay, I, my unit size is $100. And you just bet $100 on everything. And if it's an underdog... We, we, so another thing is with the American odds system, it's really cool how it works. And by American odds, I mean minus 110, minus 110, as opposed to the decimal scoring system, which is 1.91, 1.91 in terms of odds. So... With the, decimals, with the decimal system, if you're on decimal odds, when you put in a $100 bet, it returns you $91.19, which is the equivalent of betting 110 to win 100, right. but you're only risking 100 and returning amount. So if you're betting, let's say, a huge favorite, it might risk $100 to win $9. So what you're doing if you're using the decimal system is you are betting $100 on every bet, whether it's a favorite or an underdog. Now, in terms of actual best practice, this is wildly incorrect of what you should do. You should be betting more money on the favorites because they have a higher likelihood of winning. And you should be betting less money on an underdog because there's a lower likelihood of winning. So with the American odd system, a favorite might be minus 270. If a favorite's minus 270, you should, in theory, be staking $270 to win 100 uh, compared to something that is minus 110 favorite in which you're at minus 110 for 100. Uh, sorry, $110 for 100. Now, these systems are not 100% correct through everything, but this is a good enough wagering staking system yep. for um, for recreational bettors. What I typically do is on an underdog, um, just because people want easy. They want $100 bet, $50 bet, $200 bet, $150 bet. People don't want to, you know, start calculating, I got 79 here, 123 here, and stuff like that. So what I would recommend, if you just want to do the flat betting method and you want to merge with American odds, this is what most people do. The best thing you can do is keep your flat bet. If you're betting a minus 400, risk 400 to win 100. If you're betting a minus 270, risk 270 to win 100. If you're betting a plus 100, risk 100 to win 100. 
on the underdog side, it becomes a little more difficult. So you can bucket this in. You know, what I would say is if you're betting something that is between plus 100 up to maybe roughly plus 130, plus 140, you can still probably bet the flat 100. Right. Once you get to plus 150 to 200, you should be cutting that stake in half. So you should be betting only 50 at that level. And then if you get something that's a super long shot, you know, maybe like a plus 600, technically speaking, you should really only be betting like, you know, if we're keeping in flat increments, 10 or $20. So ultimately what you want to do is make sure you're using this American odds betting system. It's really miraculous how it's designed like this, but don't feel the need to bet more on the underdogs because you know, Oh, it's only a hundred bucks and it's going to pay me 1600. If I win a plus 1600, it's actually better to stake less on those and more on the favorites, despite the fact that obviously it's painful to lose a bet on a big favorite. So that is the benefit of the flat betting scenario for recreational betters. And when we look at percentage of bankroll, what it also enables you to do, as Rob said, is if you win more money, then you stake more money. So what I would recommend uh, in terms of, you know, somebody doing a percentage of bankroll scenario, if you don't want to go through the whole ins and outs, calculate Kelly criteria and calculate everything, and you're just betting, you're just flat betting. What I would do is once a month, check your history in Betstamp, track everything in Betstamp, check your history, see what your new bankroll is. If you started off with a bankroll of a thousand bucks, and now it's up to 2000, then you should calculate a simple, easy way to do it. Just calculate your new percentage of bankroll. So let's say you're betting 2% a roll and you went up to $2,000. Now you can bet 2% on the 2000 and maybe keep it like that for one month, right? And then at the next month, see how you did again, analyze your results. And if you're back down to 1500, now lower your flat bet for this month. What that does is it enables you to actually change your flat betting system and, and correctly bankroll manage without having to go through every, and before you place any single bet, run it through some software or some Excel sheet, which is obviously very tedious, especially if you're just betting, you know, more for fun or to make a little bit of money. So that would be my recommendation on the flat versus percentage of bankroll. To be clear, I'd go percentage of bankroll, but you don't need to update it every second, you know, update it once a month and figure that out. Right. And f for those who might not really understand why you would adjust your bet sizing accordingly, you can very easily find an odds converter online to convert the betting odds to a percentage probability. So someone might say, well, you know, why would I lower my, my risk on a big underdog? Well, let's say you're betting something that's plus 1000 plus 1000 is an implied probability of 9%, 9.1% to be exact. So you wouldn't want to risk the same amount on a bet. That's only going to win 9.1% of the time as you would as that's on something that's a coin flip where you're expected to win 50% of the time or something even higher. And obviously it would suck to lose something that's minus 1000 anytime you bet it. I mean, that's just the reality of sports, especially when you have a big bet on it because you know, you're risking more on a, on a bet that's has an implied probability that's higher an implied probability where you're more likely to win, but that's just how you balance action, plain and simple. So very good points there. We'll get into the more advanced staking system, so to speak. Um, I'll start with confidence level staking, I will call it. Um, and then we'll get into Kelly criteria. So confidence level staking is the notion that you should stake more on a bet that you're more confident in, plain and simple. I mean, this might seem like common sense to somebody, but if you're writing down an NFL card on any given week and you got five bets that you're going to place for the NFL, but you're much more confident in one of the five bets, generally speaking, you believe that you have a larger edge on that bet and you should be willing to bet more on that. That's where we deviate from the flat betting system here. We're getting to a point now where you like a game a little bit more. You might not necessarily be able to exactly quantify your edge. You might not be able to say, well, this is a 7% edge. This is a three, this is a two, but intuitively you believe that this is a much better bet than everything else you're betting you're going to want to adjust your bet sizes accordingly. That's obviously a little bit more of an advanced concept. Some people might find over time that they're getting burned on their bigger edges. That's probably a good indication that you don't have an edge in the first place. Because if you have a lot of bets over the long run and you're tracking this, we will talk about tracking a little bit more, but I, I completely echo what Johnny said about tracking your bets and how important that is. But if you start to see, you know, you've placed a thousand bets, 200 of them are your biggest edges, and you're getting killed on those big edges, you probably might want to reconsider a flat betting staking system because it's very likely that you're miscounting or, or, or like 
not really being able to realize your true edge in that type of situation. So that's the confidence level one. Now, Kelly Criterion is the most advanced of the concepts. It is a formula. It's actually an algorithm where you determine what the probability of a bet winning is. You compare that to what the sports book is offering. You plug it into a formula and it's going to spit out an exact number of what you should bet. There are dangers in Kelly Criterion. If you were to use what we call full Kelly, which is the exactly as Kelly criterion was defined, which was for financial markets, by the way, yep. not for sports betting markets, you're going to get all sorts of crazy devi- deviations where you can go up and down. So sports bettors tend to not use full Kelly stake because the only reason you would ever use a full Kelly stake is if you were 100% confident that your numbers are the correct probabilities. And no one truly believes that. They believe that they have some sort of variance in the numbers that they create. So you take a fraction of Kelly. You might do a quarter, a fifth, an eighth, whatever. But to decrease the variance. You're basically reducing this by like a few standard deviations in either side so that you're able to stay, like just give it a buffer is what is what you do when you use one eighth Kelly or quarter Kelly, which is what most people in sports betting I, I know would be using like one eighth Kelly. And then if you want to be a little more aggressive, you'd use quarter Kelly. But full Kelly criterion, as Rob mentioned, is not, um, you know, is not too prominent in the sports betting space. But to use the Kelly criterion, you have to be making your own numbers on games. Plain and simple, you have to be estimating the probability of an outcome happening. And that's not to say, like, you can do that in a number of ways. You don't have to be an originator to do that. You can use an, an implied number in the market to do that and compare to other sites, right? Lots of people do it that way. But regardless, in order for the Kelly criterion to function properly, you have to have some sort of estimated probability on what the outcome of the event's going to be. So that's a more advanced concept. I would encourage everyone who bets on sports to eventually get there. It's not going to be for everyone right away. Uh, is take, I mean, even as I first start, I bet for a decade without using any sort of great bankroll management system. Do I have regrets? Yes, I have regrets. (laughs) So so I'll correct one thing that Rob said, you mentioned you have to be making your own numbers to use Kelly criteria. And what I'll say is, I think basically what he means is you have to have numbers, right? You don't necessarily have to make them yourself. If you're, if you're, if you just have access to numbers um, or, you know, you buy data from a site and then they give out projections or things like that, it works. You don't necessarily have to be physically making them yourself. You just have to have probabilities of each outcome. So if, if they say that it's going to be, um, you know, if, if, if you're buying picks from a site that has, you know, Buffalo Bills minus five and the current lines minus three, you have to take a percentage probability that they have of that bet winning. Some sites will give it out. There's some tools that you're able to use to calculate this automatically. And then from there, you can get in your staking. So we're not going to really go through, I guess, how specifically Kelly is, is calculated. Uh, personally, I don't use Kelly Criterion too much in my day-to-day betting, which I could explain why. But um if you wanted to calculate it, there's a lot of good articles and there's a lot of free tools that you can download online. That's just an Excel sheet that shows you exactly how to Kelly stake it. So you can basically just put in your edge, put in the odds, and it'll tell you how much to bet. And you can put in your bankroll at the top and you can continually update that all together. Um, so that's, that would be my advice. If you wanted to like learn exactly how to calculate it, just go online with an article. We're not even going to do it justice talking over right. an audio podcast. Anyway, I listen at the end of the day, and a lot of these concepts are available online. We're just trying to lead you in the right direction. It's kind of, I, I'm a big proponent of do your own research on everything. I try to, to incorporate as much information as I possibly can into my decision-making. I think that's very important for everyone out there to be able to do that. So that's fair. The one thing I will say, um, is you, me and you, like, I don't use strict Kelly criteria either myself, Johnny. This is just a personal thing for me. But part of the reason why is because a lot of times I have to get down quickly. And if I'm going to try to calculate what my edge is, somebody's going to beat me to market. So over time, I basically have just become a very good estimator of what I should bet. I know how big of an edge something is for me. And this is what I'm going to bet based on that edge. And I'm going to do it. And also in other scenarios, it doesn't even apply because you might be reaching certain limits at a sports book where it's not, you're no longer just using a staking system. You're just trying to bet as much as you possibly can. Correct. So that, that would be the stage that um, I referenced earlier in terms of like why I don't really use Kelly criterion as much now. And I did definitely use it uh, as I was coming up, but the reality is 
you know, if you're betting smaller markets, st- stuff that has, you know, a limit of only maybe like a thousand dollars or a couple thousand dollars, then um, when you have an edge, it, even if your edge is like a minimum viable edge of like 2%, let's say your, your lowest edge you'll play is 2% or one and a half percent, then you could pretty much, you're, you're, if, if your bankroll is high enough, you're never actually going to reach a place where the Kelly criterion would tell you to bet less than what the max bet is. So obviously, you know, we've talked a bunch and everyone knows, you know, a lot of people know listening that you do get limited and cut off from certain sports books and it's hard to actually get a lot of money down. So, you know, it would be very hard. Let's say you wanted to bet a player prop or, you know, something like that. That's very, very small market. You know, it's hard. You're not going to be able to bet a hundred thousand dollars. So really what you're doing, instead of having to go through and put it through a calculator is, I might, might bet at two or three places. The total sum of money I get might only be a couple hundred dollars, which is below the minimum threshold compared to the bankroll. So it's a little hidden trap. The best part about Kelly staking is that if you do end up getting big enough and you grow your bankroll, then you won't have to do it. And this is for the major markets as well. So, you know, if your max bet for some of these major markets is, you know, maybe you're getting down a hundred or $150,000 on a game, you know, total, right? But if your total bankroll is 150 million, then you don't have to worry about actually how much you're getting down, right? So as you continue to grow, and obviously those are ridiculous examples that are that are quite high, but obviously we do see that in the industry, um, then, you know, you don't have to worry as much about the Kelly staking method. You can just go. So Kelly is weird. It's really, really advanced. Everybody should understand it if you want to make a go at sports betting because it's very powerful. Um, and it teaches you not only, like, it's like Rob said, if you use it for like two, three years, you're going to basically get um, the knowledge of just being able to estimate that and move quick. And even though you won't necessarily use it and plug it into a calculator after, you will be able to learn from that and you'll, you'll just know it offhand. So Kelly staking right now, when you start off sports betting, no one uses it because they don't know what it is. They just flat bet. When you get into that middle ground, everybody, is if they're sharp, should be using it. And then eventually you will graduate to a point where either A, your bankroll allows you to bet more than you can or and you won't have to worry about Kelly staking or B, you will just be able to estimate quick and move fast to market. So best part about that is that you will graduate from it, but I do recommend everybody learns. And if you have any questions on specifics, you can shoot us a DM. Uh, you could reach me just through the bet stamp account and that'll find its way to me if you just address, say, hey, question for Johnny. And then uh, obviously Rob's available on Twitter at Rob Pozzola. And for everyone out there to each their own, Whatever staking system works for you, that's going to be the one that works for you. There's inherent advantages and disadvantage to, disadvantages to every single one. Like I said with Kelly, you know, there's an inherent advantage in that you'd be betting the mathematical, mathematically correct amount on every game. The disadvantage is it might take you longer to get to market to be able to bet that. So maybe that's not for you if it's something where you're picking off injury news, for an example, and you got to be quick to market. Uh, flat betting, very easy to understand. So that's an inherent advantage. The disadvantage is you're not going to be maximizing your bankroll to the level of some of the other staking systems. But the reality is, I think it's a good idea to try to stick to like as close to one as possible, just to prevent the, a lot of the emotion of betting. And I think that's where a lot of people just kind of lose their way is they, it's, it's very difficult to remove the emotional element of betting. Sometimes we've all been there, including professionals. It's very hard to find someone who in, at one point in time did not chase on a bet, lost a bunch of bets in a row, tried to win it all back. Or conversely, some people will get extremely hot. They think it's like some hot streak and they're doing something different when in reality, it's a positive run of variance and they blow that money very quickly because they don't really know how to bet properly. So when you do adhere to some type of staking system, you just become a little bit more disciplined. And I think that's a very important quality in a successful better. Yeah, and we talked about this on a previous episode, but in my opinion, you know, like the whole discipline thing is completely separate, right? So obviously stick to this as it'll probably help you be more disciplined. But the reality is like, if you're a degenerate gambler who has got a gambling problem and you're just going to dunk money on anything, no matter what, then like this, whether, whatever staking method you use is not, it's not going to matter because you're just going to find bets to dunk on. So actually like, like bankroll management is, is literally just how much should I be betting to optimize my total amount of money that I have to help me not go bust and to help me make the most amount of money possible. In my opinion, it has nothing to do with like, be like, you know, don't chase. Don't chase is not a good tip for bankroll management. Don't chase is a good tip for not being a problem gamer or not being someone who's going to dunk your money away. It has nothing to do with actually managing it. So that's why we want to get into the weeds. I have a couple more tips here 
for bankroll management that I just jotted down as Rob was talking. Um, number one, if you are significantly off market in your model, you should probably set some sort of cap onto your, your limit, right? So with Kelly staking, you know, if you have, let's say, uh, let's say you're like, oh, I got a 50% edge on this thing. You probably don't have a 50% edge on it if it's a straight market game. And you're going to learn that as you continue to model and get better. But that might tell you to risk a significant portion of your bankroll. What I would do is I'd still set a cap if you're originating yourself, just so you don't get into the scenario where you are risking too much because you're following the staking method. But what the incorrect input is, is your, your edge. So obviously with anything, it's like, you know, a garbage in garbage out kind of system. And if you're giving them, I got a 25% edge on this 30% edge on this, it's going to stake you out sizes that are way too high for you to be betting based on your model. So you should probably set some sort of cap or maybe regress your numbers if exactly. you're modeling to the market number so that no edge you have is bigger than like six or seven. And what that does is not necessarily cut plays for you, but what it'll do is just show you what your bigger edges are and you can play those. So that's number one. Number two is if you are using uh, only one model and you're betting a ton of games for that, you know, your model can be significantly off. So you should also be more cautious. You know, if you're betting 30 different sports and it's 30 different models or 30 different sources, um, then, you know, you can go ahead and just follow staking. But if you're only betting NHL you're using one model, obviously could get to a point where the, the garbage coming in is going to be your data and you're going to lose on that. So just be a little cautious. And then the last thing goes hand in hand with that. Anything you bet that is correlated needs to be reduced. So if you're betting Montreal Canadiens money line, Montreal Canadiens minus one and a half, you got to reduce that staking size. There's no rule of thumb as to how much you reduce it, but you cannot be betting a full unit on two things that are the essentially, now obviously the Montreal Canadiens to win by two could, could lose and the money line could win obviously if they win by one, but you absolutely cannot be betting the same amount, just the flat staking on both of those or whatever Kelly says, because they are super correlated in terms of outcome. One more thing just to add, and I'm going to add this because of personal experience of dealing with a friend of mine who bets high volume, who would have picked a staking size of, I don't know, two and a half percent, three and a half, three percent of his bankroll, and then bets 40 plays in a day. Well, what's 40 times 3%? It's 120%. How do you bet 120% of your bankroll? So you obviously have to adjust that play size depending on the amount of plays that you make. And it might seem like common sense. For those who use Kelly, there's obviously ways to do it and, and you can research about that. But if you don't and you're just doing some sort of regular staking, but you're playing high volume, you're going to want to pick a smaller percentage as your average bet size to avoid having 100% of your bankroll in play on every single day or exceeding the amount of bankroll that you have to play with, which obviously is illogical. So just something that's just like a pitfall. It doesn't affect a ton of people because no one, there aren't a lot of people out there that are playing that type of volume. But if that does apply to you, that's something that you have to keep in mind. Okay, so uh, that was it for bankroll management from Rob and I. Um, you know, if you have any advanced questions, you have anything you didn't understand, shoot us a DM. You can even actually DM at circles off on Twitter and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Send up some advanced ones if you want us to cover another topic or if you want Rob to make more of an advanced video on Kelly staking or any staking method in general. So that's it for that. Uh, we are also going to now bring in Luke, who, as Rob mentioned earlier, is, um, you know, one of the leaders here on, on our social media team at Betstamp uh, to give a quick background. You know, Luke is someone who is a very, very knowledgeable sports fan. You know, he, he can name all the players. This guy's in like 36 different fantasy football leagues, dynasty. <laughs> like he knows way more, you know, way more about the NFL uh, in terms of like player names, defensive players, guys who are up and coming draft picks. However, obviously in terms of the betting stuff, a lot of the stuff he says sometimes it's like, oh man, that's, that's so wrong. And he's improved significantly since starting to work here, but we want to bring him on go over his thought process and uh, you know, we can just kind of give some rationale as to why some of the things he's saying are correct and then why we feel some of the things may be incorrect. So overall, that's the purpose of this exercise. And um, you know, we are going to, we are going to ask him about Derrick Henry as well off the bat. So we'll bring in Luke 30 burger, 30 burger, 30 burger. You best believe we're now joined by Lay it with Luke, baby. And uh, before we get started, I got to gripe with your producer real quick. So I take good, valuable time out of my day to do the DGen Fund videos, okay? And this guy, who I don't know how much you're paying him, but it's clearly too much, puts in the title, sometimes gets lucky with NBA picks. I want you guys to understand something. I get right on like 51% of my NBA picks. I own a controlling stake 
incorrect NBA picks. <laughs> Zach, if well, if you get lucky on fifty one percent of NBA picks, or sorry, if you get lucky on NBA picks, you're hitting fifty one percent. I would agree with Zach that you're probably one percent lucky. <laughs> Zach, if pull, you're pull up his bad stamp page. Yeah, let's get okay. Yeah. So we Go we on. brought Luke in here. We're gonna we're gonna get to his. This is uh, your your bet history already has some stuff that. <laughs> You've logged 30 bets, which is good. I see you've been taking a break. I know you're working hard, so that's fine. I'm okay with that. ROI looks good. Closing line value, not so good. Um, I particularly noticed how you got a couple of $40. uh, I guess they would be your big bomb bangers if I had to. Big bomb bangers. Oh, yeah. Uh, Big bomb bangers. The Nagasaki of big bomb bangers. And then you have uh, some $2 and $5 plays. It's very random sizing. So we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about it a little bit because I think that there's some opportunity for you here to... I think that Leonard Fournette was a hedge against a bet I made with him. Yes, sir. <laughs> you, you, he hedged a, a person an in-person bet. <laughs> I, I bet him that Leonard Fournette would get 70 yards and a touchdown. I wanted to do him a solid, so I gave him plus 100 on Leonard Fournette. 70 total yards plus a touchdown, and he ended up p- popping in 102. So cash that one but I, I did see you hedge so that's awesome you know you, you hedged off with any time listen if, if the value if the money you know as i said in the hedging video if it's if it's you're not going to lose sleep at night because you lost a bet and you want to make sure you got something on it then listen, by all i gave means. him i gave him solid odds there so the hedge wasn't even bad because he could have like fournette could have just popped under 70 yards and a touchdown he would have won both no the only bad part about it is johnny's take that leonard fournette is the second best running back in the league other than that i everything's fine. I think he just does that to rattle you though. I'm not, I'm not convinced he actually believes that if he does believe that, I don't, I don't know, but I feel like you're just doing that to rattle him. Fournette is an absolute stud. The bucks are not the same when he's not on the field. No, I'm, See, I'm, I still don't even like, know. Yeah. Well, if you like, say it like that, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm, I do think he's unreal. I do think Fournette's unreal, but I also, I, you know, I don't value the running back position as, as much, but F- Le- Leonard's the man. Now, if Leonard's the man, Derrick Henry is a step above. And me and you have both admitted that we have no hope against Derrick Henry. So, Luke. So this would be a one-on-one Oklahoma drill. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. Get up. Henry's got the ball. Luke's opposed on the other side. And it's got to be like, can he tackle him or does Henry get by? You know, obviously there's not unlimited time. He doesn't have the full field. He's got to either run by him or break the tackle. All right. So with that being said, and we, we got to get some, like, if you're a listener, you have to, Put, put in the percentage chance you think you'd tackle Derrick Henry in as a, as a listener. We have to get a bigger sample And size. if you're just listening, go to YouTube so you can see what Luke looks like for perspective as well. Well, I, it feels like a shot almost taken at me. Well, li- listen, <laughs> you're, you're, you're in decent physical shape. You're young. Like you, I could tell that you're somewhat athletic. I could tell his jacket's a little bit too big for you or, and whatever. <laughs> no, it's a so beautiful jacket. But give, it's beautiful. Give, I, love no, the, so give, I love the texture. Give but, the specs. If you're, if you're happy with it, you know, give like a height and weight so we can at least get a lineup. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up Derrick Henry's. Sure. For sure. So 5'11". Yep. About buck 80 as of this morning. Yep. And a uh, huge shout out to RW and Co. for being my personal stylist for the episode today. <laughs> it's a nice jacket. It is a nice jacket. Um, yeah. I mean, so what, what's your strategy? Like, did, so you, did you play Derek high school Henry football? Is, uh, what do we got here? So it just according to Google, quick, obviously, I know these are not the most accurate. Looks like he's 6'3 and uh, 250, 250 pounds. So, so you said 5'11". 180. Yeah. Do we know what Josh Norman's physical specs are? Because I remember Derrick Henry basically throwing Josh Norman like he was a ragdoll. And this is a professional, physically fit football player that even couldn't even come close to to tackling Derrick Henry. You ever played Madden before? And in Madden, they explain to you, oh, if they if the cornerback could catch the ball, they'd be playing wide receiver. Okay. Corners don't know how to tackle. You ever see a corner tackle? Jalen Ramsey, for all he's worth couldn't tackle me if I had the ball, much less anybody in the NFL, okay? Guy throws his body at people. There's a difference between a corner and me. I, me, went from the line right to linebacker. And look, you ask me about if I played high school football. I played high school football. You ever do a clean and He was an injury away from the NFL, by the way. There you go. (laughs) Huge injury away. Would have gone pro if it wasn't for the bum knee. (laughs) Have you ever done clean and jerks before? Okay. I spent more time in high school doing cleaning jerks than, you know, doing it in the comfort of my own home. And so the whole, (laughs) so all I'm saying is, is those twitch muscles are still there. There's no way that they're just gone. So it's all about that twitch. That's what Derrick Henry doesn't have on me. Okay. So what, give give me your rationale for like to break down this bet. Like, or if you, what, what's your strategy on tackling him and why do you think he's not getting by? 
Yeah, for sure. So there's two ways I approach this, okay? First way is we go for the ankles. We get the gator rule. It bites. I don't try to go up top. I don't try to lay him out. I go for the clean, solid, everyday hit. Yep. It's like pressing A on Madden, yep. okay? The second way we do it is I throw brass knuckles in my gloves, okay? <laughs> and when Derrick Henry runs at me, I just low blow him WWE style. I still don't think he's going down. No. I really think, don't. <laughs> so you think a regular hit, you go, you're going low, going for the ankles, or you're going for the... The thighs. Look, if you look at the video of Josh Norman getting tossed by Derrick Henry, the biggest mistake he made is he, he's as he's like, upright. He's as tall as yeah. like the Eiffel Tower. Like, buddy, get low. You know, I, I do agree that at least you've thought about this and you have some sort of strategy. Where I disagree is that that's going to have any effectiveness at all. Like, you, this guy's going to lay down on the ground and try to hug Derrick Henry's ankles and hope that like. You you ever seen the no, balance? You seen tackles, the balance though, the drills way. that these guys do? By the way, have you seen the balance drills that NFL running backs do? It is absurd. Like the core strength and the balance is nuts. Like okay, p- people dive at the ankle. Like professional pl- football players are diving at the ankles in the open field and t- trying to pull a guy down. And he's just shedding them like it's nothing. Yeah, I know. I mean, for me, if I were to approach this drill and I had to make the tackle, like first off, I don't think I. I, d- I definitely don't think I'm a favorite to make the tackle. I mean, yeah, it's. It's a tackle, right? So, like, if you get enough tries, you're going to make it. Don't get me wrong. I'm fully aware of that. But could what, fall over you, too. You never know. What, what, right? I, what I would do is, like, you know, I'd, I'd try to, like, you know, I'd turn around. I'd force him one way, let him get the edge, dive for the ankles, try to trip him up. That's my, in my opinion, I think I that's agree. my best that's shot. That's the best move. But. Or he tries thing, to hurdle you, and he, you catch him, like, in mid-hurdle. You know what I mean? He's not going to hurdle, though. All he has to do is lower shoulder. You have to go really low. You have to go low or dive at the ankles on a, on a, as he's rolling by. Otherwise, like, just sheer size alone and obviously like he's gonna hold on the ball in one hand like if you let him get close and you're upright he's just gonna stiff arm you of course that's why i'm saying like i guess it depends if it's just a one-time thing or if you're getting like 10 attempts because if you're getting 10 attempts you do like four or five the exact same way and try to lead him into like you're gonna do that so diving at his feet right i I just basically lay down at his feet as quickly as i could but then i try one time this is my only hope to like fake that and stay upright and hope the guy tries to jump over me or something and like he's still gonna crush me, but maybe he like loses balance. Yeah, the difference is though, is you guys need multiple attempts. I need one. <laughs> okay, I so- call me Luke Skywalker because I am your only hope. Like- <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get into the betting. Uh, anyone, please comment. We we gotta hear answers. Like, do you think you can ha- you can tackle Derrick Henry? If so. Um, like how many tries or, you know, give me a percentage likely that you'd, you'd tackle him, right? I, I want to, I, I want to see pictures too, of what you look like. I, I mean, listen, you don't have to, like some people don't want to share images of themselves online, but if you're willing to, and you know, you get, we get like a full, I, I don't, I, like a lot of people are going to say, oh, for sure I can do it. And then you're going to find out that they're like five, six, 145 yeah. pounds. And like they would, there's a better chance that they would die on a tackle than they would be able to make the we tackle. spoke with someone last week who's a current cfl uh offensive lineman former mm-hmm. uh, nfl uh veteran a couple of years a couple of seasons in the nfl mm-hmm. and um when luke asked him the question he's like listen like you've played against this guy like do you think you think i could tackle him and he gave him the specs same deal and, and then we won't name the person but he he did say he's like you got a shot mm-hmm. he was like he's like you definitely have a shot at like at one tackle so and he's he listen that guy's in the game we're not in the game it's true we've never actually like We've never attempted. Who am I to comp? Jeff Garcia would be upset with me. I've never played the game. He would say that I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyone could do this. That's. I mean. So let's get it. Let's get into the betting. Hope hopefully you guys obviously enjoyed that discussion. And, and please let us know. Like we need a bigger sample size. We're we're like in Canada. Football is not as big. In the, it's like, we're huge fans. Obviously the NFL, but reality is like the high schools here. Like it's not even a guarantee that your high school has a football team. So yeah, it's true. like you won't you don't necessarily get exposed to football uh, in terms of playing it. You know, you play pickup games with your buddies and stuff like that. But my high school, for example, didn't have a football team. You know, we had other teams and, you know, it's like hockey. You went to the the same high school I did. Did they get rid of the football program? Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, our football program sucked when I was there. But... A bunch of Italians on a football team. Well, I but, well because first of all, our, our high school, and probably the same when jo- Johnny's younger than me, but probably the same when he went, is, was literally 99% Italian. Italian-Canadian kids. I don't know it if it's... It diversifies high- as you get younger. Okay, sure. But maybe when you were there. Like but. everyone played soccer. Uh, we had the best soccer team in Ontario, basically. Always used to go to the provincials and win every single year. But 
no one played football. Football was we didn't even have a football team. I think it was like soccer, uh, soccer, we had a soccer team, baseball team, hockey team, maybe like a rugby. Rugby, team. yeah. No, no, ba- no, uh, no football. And I would, I would have loved to obviously play and check it out, but it is what it is. Um, I, I'm relegated to like pick up flag football, touch football, wide receiver. You know, moss a couple guys here and there, and then <laughs> all right, know, buddy, pu- pu- <laughs> moss <laughs> a couple guys here and there. Tear my quad and then never play again. That's that's the, the life. Okay, look, before we segue into my picks and I get picked apart, I'm going to give you the best clickbait title you can possibly get. That's the camera, right? Derrick Henry, I challenge you, 1v1 Oklahoma drill. Loser donates $10,000 to the charity of the winner's choice. Derrick Henry, do you hate charity? <laughs> Big the people want to know. That, that's, that's, the easy, that's like the easiest way to... Like back in the day when I was a radio producer, that's kind of the always how we would try to get big name personalities on. It's like, you know, Philip Rivers, call up the agent, would be like, we'd be very happy to make a donation to the Rivers of Hope Foundation. And then like, if they declined, we'd be like, come on, it's like for charity, let's let's get it going. So Luke is already a professional in trying to get the, the celebrities and the athletes on. Uh, Charles Woodson, be happy to promote your wine company. Just come on. We'll talk some wine for five minutes. He's like, I'm in. Let's See, do it. We're never, it is never, literally never going to happen because like, there's no way Henry could do this. No, he like, can't. It's impossible. I mean, he, they, would, he, would, he would have to like do it behind the back of, of his franchise. What we'll have to do, like the only way we'll be able to do this, which is nowhere even close to Garrett, getting Derrick Henry, but we'd have to get like a retired running back. We have to get like Ricky Williams, who's like 50 years old and just like, bring them out and, and see what can happen. Like, it's not even a close to a comparison, but like no professional running back is doing these drills where they can get, to, they'll, they'll, they'll like participate in some random fun stuff, but it's not going to be any contact. Yeah, Ricky Williams, he's 44. If we brought out Ricky Williams and he got by you, then you'd have to concede the Derek well, Henry. Ricky Williams would probably smoke a blunt before he went up against me. You if I didn't tackle Ricky not Williams, that there's anything there's wrong, wrong, wrong with that legal in a lot of States and provinces now, no issues with that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, if he did smoke a blunt, I mean, classified as a performance enhancing drug by the NFL, right? Exactly. So we would have to, I mean, we don't know if we can take anything away from that. I think he got suspended a couple of times for sure for that. He did. Could we drug test Ricky Williams? No, we, well, let's figure out if we can get a retired NFL running back who is not even 6'3 and 250 pounds and he, and he passes you, you got to concede the Henry bet. If you tackle him based on how the form of that tackle is and how it goes, I may, I may then back you. Okay, give me, day. give me Eddie Lacy. Eddie Lacy. Give me Eddie Lacy. I, I see. I was thinking Jerome Bettis. Now, like obviously, Derrick Henry has way more burst than Jerome Bettis, but I think similar type of physique, like bruiser running back, where going to run through tackles. Marion Barber the third. What? Remember so Marion Barber? Barber? He yeah, just he, that guy didn't know about going out of bounds. He never would go out of bounds. He would always cut back in bounds and just steamroll whoever was in his way. That's the kind of running back that I'd like to see you challenge. So we're saying the odds of me tackling Derrick Henry are so low that we now need to go to retirement homes to get Jerome Bettis out here? Come yeah, on. I, I, I would Come honestly on. just like to see Marion Barber try to run through you. That's it. <laughs> like, I, he, he might, you might be able to tackle him just based off of him and trying to hit you so badly that he falls over you, but it would be fun. No, a better guy to get all time, Trent Richardson. Trent Richardson. I mean, he, Rich- played, he played in the CFL, no? I don't, I don't know if he ended up going there, but Trent Richardson's one of like the biggest busts ever at running back, right? I remember when he got traded. I thought it was such a horrible trade at the time. Little did I know about running backs back then. But yeah, his yards, career yards per carry is ugly. Very, did very he, bad. He did play in the CFL. Saskatoon. I could Saskatchewan. label him. Saskatchewan. So yeah. I, I could you know label the CFL him. teams? In 2017, he played. Trying to tackle uh, Derrick Henry. He got 48 attempts for uh, 259 yards. Not bad. Four. Yeah, <laughs> 48 attempts for 259. In average, the CFL? Average, average 5.4 yards a carry. Yeah, that's not bad. Two touchdowns, though, only in four games, and he got one catch. But what was his success rate and EPA per play? Yeah, we got to, like, uh, they don't even the track The CFL will track that in by CFL. 2040. Yeah, they'll they don't start even track those metrics in CFL. All right, Luke, let's, let's walk through your betting here. So, first of all, what are, you, what are you betting for? Like, is it entertainment? Are you actually trying to win money? Is it a combo of both? Like, lay it down as, what are your goals as a better? Yeah, so uh, lay it with Luke. We'll lay it down real quick for you. So the goal is to buy my mom's a house one day. But if we don't get there, it's to get to $100 in each sports book. That's about, okay. that's about it. The goal would be is to get to a point where, you know, I've gotten enough money in each book 
that I can give everybody the finger in this office. Got it. <laughs> now, what, like, what's your typically your deposit? So when you say you want to get to 100 in each book, you're depositing like 20 bucks to start? Depends. Depends okay. how confident but in that, But in that range. Yeah, NFL season, I'll, be, I'll, I'll put more in. Um, but for the most part, it kind of dwindles depending on the sport. Okay. As you can see from his betting history, you know, he's betting anywhere from like two bucks on some long shots or some regular games all the way up to maybe like 40 bucks if he feels confident. Hit analysis really quickly there, uh, Zach, just so we can see his average bet size. So his average bet's $30.91 right oh, now. And he, and he has a $100 bet in there. It's yeah. not that big bad. bomb bang. He has a big <laughs> bomb banger, that $100. Okay, so let's yeah. walk us through. You obviously do DGen Fund picks mm-hmm. for us. We all do within the office. For those who have no idea what DGen Fund is, I'll just lay it out there. But um, about a year ago, we started what we call the DGen Fund, where the co-founders, Johnny and Julie and, and myself, put in some money. And the goal for us was to just line shop our way to $100,000. Uh, by finding like whatever we wanted to bet on. It didn't matter whether like what it was. If we threw something out there, we'd find the best line available in the market and bet it. We've been able to grow that, had ups and downs, but the whole DGen fund now is part of the bet stamp office. Anyone within the office can throw a pick in there as long as it's the best available number. And we do actually bet these as well. So Luke's been doing these up and downs for you as well. But Mm -hmm. I want to know what goes into your process. Like if, if you come into the office, first of all, do you just start handicapping in the morning? Do you do start doing it the night before? What's like, you picked the Charlotte Hornets for us today? Like every time they're playing, I pick okay. the Charlotte Hornets. So what goes into that? Walk me through how you locked in the Charlotte Hornets bet today. Yeah, I just want a pair of big baller brand shoes. <laughs> but but what, so no, like that, let's actually okay, be serious. Okay. Like why do you, why do you pick, like, so when you're like, yeah, Charlotte's a good bet. What's the re- rationale behind it? Are you looking at the players? Are you looking at injuries? Like, what is it? Yeah, so for sure. With Charlotte, I'm going to be honest with you, they should be higher in the rankings in the East. Right now, they what are... What do you mean by rankings? Like seeding? The seeding. Like should they're more wins than Yeah, it. they're in seventh place right now. They've been battling injuries throughout the season. So Kelly Oubre has been out for a bit. Gordon Hayward just got COVID. He's out. Look, they're one star center or power forward away. And LaMelo Ball and Bridges are going to take them to the promised land. They look as like... Right now, if you were to tell, ask me, like, who are the two up-and-coming teams in the East and the West, it's Memphis and Charlotte. Both of them are built with the proper point guard to lead them to the promised land. Okay, so with Charlotte specifically, you're of the opinion that the market is kind of sleeping on them. They should be ranked better than they are. Do you use any sort of resources whatsoever in your handicapping? Like, do you go to any website specifically, look at stats? What, what, break that down. First thing I do is check injuries. If the mellow ball is out, probably should not bet on the Hornets. Always check injuries first, you know? Um, after that, it's really just, you know, you play a round of 2K22 with the team. You see how they feel, how the shooting arc is, and then you just cash it. Okay, so I know he's, I know he's joking on that, but he did say a lot of stuff that's true. I think, okay, so here's one thing we'll, we'll add in. We've said this before, like... The standings, maybe we haven't said this before, actually. The standings do not matter, okay? Meaningless, completely but meaningless. Especially in something like the NBA, where there's so many games, and and literally, like, the teams that, like, they don't even care to finish first for, for whatever reason. Like, the, the best teams typically will actually not even finish first over the past three seasons, at least. They've just been trying to rest players and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm looking at the standings right now, and what I'll say is, like, it doesn't matter the the actual rankings. So this is a really good one. And, um, you know, obviously, like, you look at the East and, like, the Bulls are in first in the East. No, like, the Chicago Bulls are going to be an underdog versus a, 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 a vast amount of teams. Like, they would be an underdog at a lot of teams, including some teams in the East, such as we look at, um, you know, for example, like Milwaukee mm-hmm. or Philly. Like, they'd be... It, I, I believe, you know, again, I don't follow it too, too closely. So I, I can't give estimates on like exactly what they'd be. But, you know, you're looking at a team that's in first for sure. They'd be a dog to a couple of teams. So the standings themselves don't actually matter. Anything to add, Rob? I, I, one more thing. So he's targeting a specific team right here, right? Saying that I think Charlotte's really undervalued. Yeah, a lot of people do that. A lot of people will do that. But here's what I will say. Even just looking at his history right over here, I see a bet Charlotte minus 150 on Sunday, January 23rd with a negative 4.4% CLV. That was pretty bad. So you should be monitoring this regularly. And if you're betting Charlotte regularly and the market is moving against you often, I would say there's an extreme likelihood that you should probably take a step back from that and say, I'm missing something here because the the reality of the NBA is we know what limits are on the NBA. It's Mm -hmm. a major North American sport 
where there's people literally betting six figures on these games in a lot of cases. More, more. Yeah. So, so to say, I, I, I don't want to demean you, and this is not what we're trying to do here. No, this is on, honestly, honest advice, right? And it happens to me too, all the time. And it happens to Johnny too. We've talked about our respect for the market a lot of times. But if you're going to put your foot down and say, I think this team is undervalued, that's fine. But when the market is moving against you constantly, you have to take a step back and say, it's possible I'm wrong here about this team. Or maybe I'm going to be a little bit more cautious with my approach. Maybe if the market is always moving against me, I'm not going to play this game at 9 a.m. I'm going to play it at game time because then I'm coin flipping rather than having a expected value of like 45% or something. Yeah. One other thing I noticed when looking at your thing, which was very extremely disappointing. So <laughs> I, I know you have, you have three sports books, right? I know you have Bo, uh, Bodog. Bodog. I know you got Bet365. I know you got Betway, right? I don't have a Betway. You don't have a bet. Do you have no money in it or you don't have an account? I might have made an account in university and I don't even know if I ever placed a bet. Okay, fair enough. So you're going to use the forgot so, password. So like. what are you using? Two accounts. Two accounts, basically. Bodog and Bet365. Okay, so here's so here's something that, and I know what you mentioned. I know the reason why you don't use more than that account is because you, you're only allocating a certain amount of money to sports betting. So you don't have, like, it's not like you're saying, hey, I got uh, $20,000 in my Bodog account and no money in other sports books. You know, you might have 100 bucks. In, in each or something like that or around there. And then you, you can't really like spread it around as much if you only have 200 bucks. I get it, right? What I would say is instead of just placing bets at these two books and trying to grow, the best advice you can do as a recreational better is you got to just take like two months off betting, save money, get to an amount of money that you can put into it that you can now open up six or seven books and have a hundred dollars in each and then bankroll manage those accordingly. Because I see here, like by you only betting at bet three, six, five on like that Vancouver Canucks bet, for example, like, you know, there's a, there's a chance that that was the best line in the market. Obviously there's a slight chance, but in all likelihood, it probably wasn't when you're only using two books and we have upwards of, you know, 25, 30 sports books available here in Canada that you can sign up at. So the goal would be like it, not everyone can get there off the rip. We know that, but you should definitely save up enough that you can contribute a bunch into each book. On top of that, for someone like you, like, you know, we see your average bet size, like 30, 40 bucks. Um, you know, when you're depositing at a new book, okay. And we, we will discuss this obviously, but you're going to get a bonus. So exactly. there's a specific book, there's specific books that, you know, you might deposit at where you deposit a hundred and they give you a hundred dollar match bonus that comes in cash, or maybe it's a free player. Maybe it's something like that. Now you have 200 in that book. If you can save up, and max out the deposit bonuses in every book, you're now going to double your bankroll for off the rip, right? And it's going to be a meaningful amount to your starting space because of your, like I said, you're, you're, if you're betting 30 bucks a game and you just got a hundred dollars in bonus bankroll, you just made three, three and a third units. Yeah. No, off like, the rip. like I totally see where you're coming from. Like for me, what the big thing is, is like the reason why my, be- look, put it out there right now. Not an excuses guy. Here's a huge excuse. Look, I try to like, obviously I want to shop the best lines, yep. right? That's why I use Betstamp. Follow me at Lay with Luke. The whole point though, is that like, I do best with certain sports, right? And for the most part, like, you know, I bet with people occasionally. So they, and they like a certain platform. It's hard to get them to like change it up. So my thing is, is I will deposit as much as I possibly can into a book. And I try to manage my bankroll accordingly. So I, I look at it like this. Obviously, I'm, you know, as you pointed out, I'm a little younger. So if something were to happen to me tomorrow, right? Let's say I have a Lieutenant Dan situation. I lose both legs. Well, do I want all my money tied up in like in the in sports betting? Probably not, right? But can I have a, like, could I open up enough books to feel more comfortable? Probably. Right. Yeah. Probably. So that, that's why I'd recommend just like, save up enough until you can allocate a good amount of money to sports betting, right? Don't, don't bet right now and, and continue to lose money because you're only using two books and not taking advantage of any bonuses. Like your next deposit should not be to bet three, six, five or Bodak. Your next deposit needs to be to another book where you're getting a deposit bonus. That's mm-hmm. the easiest way to grow your bankroll in the short term is like you essentially, you need to have your next deposit needs to be a new sports book. Your next deposit after that needs to be another one. Agreed. And eventually you should be saving up enough to max it out. So whether that means, Hey, you know, you're obviously working now, like save a portion of your, like what I would recommend if I was you 
I would have, when I was your age, I'd save a portion of my pay and allocate a little bit more to sports betting every month if I wanted to take it seriously. And eventually I'd build the whole portfolio where I don't have to worry that, you know, I don't have like, cause you're hundred percent right, by the way. And it's something we went over in the beginning. There's, if you're starting out or you're a college kid and you just turned 21 or 19 in Canada, the legal betting age, like you, in all likelihood, it's probably not the best use of your money to dunk $3,000 into uh, 10 different sports books. However, if you can save that up and start going, start with 200, win a little, process it, withdraw, put in another, put in another, you can build it up slowly and make sure that you're able to basically find success in that. That's the one, the main thing you're doing wrong, in my opinion, is that, okay? On top of that, we'll get into the injury stuff that you mentioned, like first things, look at injuries. I'll let Rob take that one. Well, uh, you're looking at things that are the entire market is aware of Mm -hmm. and have already been priced in. Unless you're looking at injuries or getting the injury information and you're going and acting very quickly before the line moves, the reality is all that information is public knowledge. Everybody's using it. Mm -hmm. It's already priced into the number. So it might feel like you're getting an edge. A lot of people do this. I did this for 10 years, literally with hockey. This Peter Forsberg is out for Colorado. Like I'm fading them tonight. It's, it's stuff that's already pre- factored into the line. It's already mm-hmm. been bet into shape. So from that point of view, I don't really think that there's anything valuable in looking at the injury specifically, unless it's some sort of new breaking information. Um, it, it, you know, listen, there is a likelihood, albeit very, very low, that the market is wrong at times or is maybe overpricing a certain player, or underpricing a certain player. I can say that from my experience, it's happened in certain sports. So maybe you can be onto something there. I'd just be a little bit more cautious. The one standout to me though. So yours was the two sports books. For me, I look down your bet history. I see bets of $2, $2, $5, $2.80, $10, $40. We got some 50s, 82 50. That was like a hundred dollar bet there. So Walk me through how you decide how much you're going to put on a bet. Yeah, for sure. So it comes down to confidence at the end of the day. It's going to sound so stupid. It doesn't sound stupid. Well, it doesn't at all. Look, every time I go with my head, I'm always 100% wrong. The gut feeling has been pretty sound up to this point, okay? Um, when I, Especially when I go to do NFL betting, that's where my, like, my bread and butter is. I, like The joke at the office is put it out for the world to know. I've got like 30 something dynasty fantasy football teams I'm managing, right? My whole life on weekends is revolving around football. Right. If I can't use that knowledge to win a bet here and there, then I'm doing something wrong. Okay. Right. I'm an above average fantasy manager, I would say. So, you know, the goal is, is like, for me is, you know, I look at injuries. That's a big thing, right? Another thing to consider as well is, well, the, like if I'm betting, you know, let's say like a Jamar Chase anytime type of thing, right? I'm not going to take Jamar Chase anytime if the one cornerback who's going to be covering him is like a Jalen Ramsey. Right. It's a shut down play. That's why I hammer T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd. In terms of kind of like what I do when I decide to pick a, like a size of a bet, it comes down to how comfortable do I feel with that player, team, play. Like, for example, A.J. Dillon over three and a half yards, that one right there. Guy's got massive legs. Are you telling me he's not going to break up for three and a, over three and a half yards on a rush? Like <laughs> first carry, I assume that is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, come on. Like, that's that's a, that was a winner, man. One. That was a winner against who did they play in that game? Uh, what was that San San Fran? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. It. So eleven dollars. Okay. Um, fine. I I listen. So hold, to, hold up, hold up. So when you're betting like Jamar Chase anytime though, and you're like, oh, Ramsey's covering him. Are, like. So that's factored into the line, right? So Jamar yeah. Chase with uh, versus a harder uh, defense is going to be like you know, plus one twenty, yeah. or sorry, mm-hmm. plus one sixty, and versus an easier defense where uh, Cincinnati is going to score a lot of points, they're probably gonna, he's probably going to be like minus one ten. So does that do you factor in the odds at all? Like do you convert it to a probability? Like you play a lot of fantasy, you should actually be able to have some solid edges in the NFL player prop market. Yeah, so for sure. So honestly, I'm going to be real with you. I try to avoid wide receiver ones if I can help it. Um, there's a lot of really high quality wide receiver two and even wide receiver threes out there who get the ball a lot. So yep. for example, Michael Gallup, when he's healthy, does he gets up there. And then even Cedric Wilson, when Gallup is out, does phenomenal. Like I, I always take a look at those guys. And then in terms of like, if I am going to bet a wide receiver one, knowing they're being covered by like a Jalen Ramsey or a James Bradbury, I'll also look at what the over under is on 
that quarterback's uh, like interceptions for the game. So, for example, if it's Joe Burrow, who publicly has said that he will force the ball to Jamar if he has nothing else, I will look at how many interceptions he will have for the game. I haven't done it yet, but it's probably something I'm going to look at the Super Bowl for, for putting up. Okay, I have two pieces of advice for you. I think that you are... I'll, I'll give them to you out loud. You don't have to take the paper. It's on the paper. But well, Can I'll, I have the paper after? I'll give you the paper after. Okay. So you remember, But if you don't remember these, I think you're hopeless at any point anyway. So there's nothing going to help you. But no, uh, I, I completely get your style. I understand the, the desire to want to handicap something or feel like your knowledge is contributing to your bet. I totally get that. But I think the biggest problem I have with the way that you speak is that you're not price sensitive. So what I mean about that is that you're targeting people to score a touchdown, for example, if you're betting any time touchdown score without being aware of what the price even is on it. Mm-hmm. So my suggestion to you going forwards, it's more work, but I think it's a good exercise in general is to put a percentage probability on what you think that player is to score a touchdown before you look at the odds and make the bet. Okay, so basically you're saying like if... You're, you're, Jam- you're thinking that you're, you're, you speak in, in uh, like concrete... I've seen this around the office, right? Like Jamar, Jamar Chase, Chase is, is going to score a touchdown this week. But we, it's not. it doesn't have to be just yes and no. Mm-hmm. It, you have to think probabilistically. And it's not really that hard. Like you can just say like, I think there's a 60% ch- chance Jamar Chase is going to score a touchdown. You can very, I can even set up a spreadsheet for you, whatever you want to do, but it's, it's good for you to learn on your own where it converts that to odds or the opposite way around. You just put in 60%, then you put the sportsbook odds in, it converts that and you bet your edges. But I think you'd be better served doing that in the long run mm-hmm. than just to target a specific player because a lot of times that's all, like Johnny said, that's already factored in the price, right? If Jamar Chase is going up against Jalen Ramsey versus going up against just a, a, a scrub quarterback. Richard Sherman. Sure, Richard oh, Sherman. He's a great back in the day. Back in the day, yes. But like, then the prices are going to be very different on for, for him to score a touchdown. So I would say number one, try to get more price sensitive. Number two, the bet sizes. You have basically made it so that you need to win your big bets in order to profit, which is fine. We just did a whole segment on bankroll management. Scroll up to the top, Zach, sorry, while we do this. This is like a confidence level type of thing. That's Talk fine. about an all-time time, though, to lower to $2. I know, exactly. And going, and going for but, but But it's fine. If, if, if It's fine to, to adjust your bet sizes based off your confidence. Mm-hmm. I, I, th- I think, like, I preach that. I suggest that you do that. But when you're betting $2... And on some plays, you're betting eighty dollars. You need to you need to bring that range closer together. Is what I'm saying because you've now made it to the point where you basically have like forty percent of your bankroll in play. Right, if you deposit a hundred bucks into two books, Bodog and Bet Three Six Five, and you're betting eighty dollars on one of the plays, you basically have forty percent of your bankroll in play on one. That's a lot to have on one play. Mm-hmm. Like you would need to have a massive edge in order to bet that size. So, in my opinion. And again, you're, everyone bets however they want to. You can ignore this advice. You could do whatever you want to. But based off your betting habits and patterns, and a lot of people do this, I would suggest just bringing that range closer together. Instead of doing a bunch of $2 bets and a bunch of $40, 50 60 70 $80 bets, do some 5s, 10s, and 20s and make that some sort of, and, and vary them based off of your confidence level, if that makes sense. No, it totally makes sense. It totally makes sense. Yeah, like, look, let's be real. I'm looking at this right now. Like, <laughs> look, I love my Canucks. Like, shout out Elias Pedersen. But, you know, yeah, let's be real. Was there a need to place that bet? Probably not. Well, you got screwed on that one. I will say, like, thank you. Because, not not because of the outcome of the game. he got a minus no, 5.1 no, no. 5. 5. He, he bet yeah. that game. He bet that game the night before, I believe. And, it, and yeah. he got screwed because Spencer Martin, the third string goalie for Vancouver, started in net. Massive downgrade. So, of course, you're going to get minus 5% CLV. You didn't get... I know Vancouver, you're going to say, oh, Vancouver was winning the game 2 nothing. They lost 3-2 in overtime. They got slaughtered in that game. Spencer Martin was the only reason that it was actually close. And, and he was the third string goalie. But So, I don't want to just look at the results-based stuff. But timing, I think, is very important as mm-hmm. well, right? Like... You have the advantage where you're not betting a whole lot on games. And again, to each their own, doesn't matter. I never bet shame in terms of sizes or whatever. But if you want to bet something the day before, you have the luxury of being able to do that. Like if you get some sort of hockey information the day before of like, 
you know, this guy's going to be a net the following day. There's not a lot of professional money that's coming into the market that early. So you have the luxury of betting early. You don't have to wait till game day. You don't have to wait till an hour before the game starts. That's something that you could probably vary as well. I think when you're more of a recreational better, you do have a better chance if you're getting involved in the early markets. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, the Canucks one, be straight real with you, is for a TikTok. Yeah, I know. Okay. And it was a fire TikTok. <laughs> it was actually a pretty good one. So, I laughed. okay. So here's the, here's the key takeaways. And I mean, I guess we can close off. Number one is uh, best, best thing you can do is think of these in terms of probabilities and instead of just like absolutes, right? Instead of saying Jamar Chase is going to score a touchdown or AJ Dillon's, he's going to get above three and a half yards. Say like, man, I think he was going to do that four in every five. And because he's going to do it four and five, that's a good bet in my opinion, right? Uh, so that's the first. Number two, and, and probably the most important, is like getting on 10 sports books is going to just help so much because you're, you're like, I don't even mean to say you're getting free money, but like with the deposit bonuses, like you have to roll them over. And in some cases, you know, you have, there's like a playthrough requirement, but these sports books want people to deposit and they're willing to give out bonuses for it. So, you know, for example, if you were to come be like, hey, Johnny, like lo- loan me like 500 bucks. I could put into five different sports books. Like, you know, it's a, it's a conversation that we made it have. Hey, give me like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I, you know, I'd, ra- I'd happily do that for you if you're going to make sure you're, you're maxing the bonuses instead of just putting in 50 because that's all you have at the time. And then obviously like, you know, and by the way, you'll get there. We're talking on camera here. Like, yeah. you know, Luke's just like, f- like fresh out of school, actually still, of still graduating school. Like it, it's not an, I was in way worse shape than he is when I was his age, because I was a problem gamer on top of, I, I was talking like him, but way worse because I thought I had it all figured out with every single game. And on top of that, I was whisk- risking way too much for what I actually what, had in terms of betting? money. What were you betting at that? Like at I, 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 I was in high school and I was building up like thousand dollar debts. Yeah. So, what about let's say f- four years out of high school, five years out, four or five years out of high school, university? And I was boy. betting nickels probably, but mo- but if I was down, I was chasing. So, like I would, I, I was, you know, you get to NFL, you have bad Sunday, and you try to win all your money back on Sunday night football. Like that was me. I've learned a lot of these lessons through experience. So, the fact that you actually have some sort of control over your bankroll, I think that's impressive. Like you don't have to change that. You're betting within your limits. The problem is that. Yeah, you're just a little bit very, like you're very reliant on these big bets hitting right now. And you got to kind of dial that back. So two points from Johnny were uh, deposit into as many sports books as possible. And that's a, that's a 100% needs to happen. Like there's no, there's no other like explanation for this. Like you need to do that. Otherwise you will not be successful coming up as a sports better unless you're like shaving off a lot of VIG and the way to do like, for example, Whatever you're down this this um, over this period over this last like li- little like let's say two weeks whatever you're down let's say you're down like uh, whatever uh, sixty I, I bucks or let's, something let's say you're down sixty mm-hmm. bucks like you would have been down fifty two now it doesn't seem like a lot but that adds up significantly as you start to scale and if you learn the concept early then you're you're flying you're literally flying and like, conversely he's up right now like his total account is Zach if we get it up to the top here is he's plus you're plus five point four units. Honestly, if you're betting at, let's say, six or seven shops, you're probably up an extra unit or yeah, close to. For sure. So f- that that's first and foremost. And then second second thing also is like, you know, you'll get there to the point where you're able to, like, my, my goal is like, I'm going to help. We're going to help Luke. This is like, we, we, we had this podcast. We're like, listen, let's get it out all on out. We'll give him some uh, tips on air. We're going to work with you. We're going to spot you some cash so you can actually take advantage of these deposit bonuses. Maybe we'll call it a an an advanced bonus or something like that. But we'll spot you some cash. You can actually take advantage of these sign up bonuses to all the books. You know, if they got a two hundred dollar match, save up and put in two hundred. You know, don't put in twenty because you never get that re sign up bonus again. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna give you some money to actually deposit in. And then my goal, I guess I have two goals. Number one is we want to get Luke line shopping and making money. But number two is the day this guy gets limited from a sports book, we know we've succeeded. I agree. I listen, I, we, we obviously want to help you again. You take our advice. You don't take our advice. doesn't matter, but, um, we've obviously lived this. This is our lives in general. So I'd like to see you, um, get better at it. But again, I, I don't want to just focus on the, the negatives. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of positive things that you're doing as well. 
Eh, is there? Keep bet track. Well, you're, you're tracking your bets. <laughs> There's a lot. You're tracking your bets. That's a positive because at least you can review your bet history at some point and say, well, you know what? This isn't working for me. Or I'm consistently, I have consistent negative CLV when I'm betting NBA. Maybe I can cut out NBA. Mm-hmm. Now, intuitively, you might already, like you think so. You think you're better NFL better, right? Oh, for sure. Right. We'll, we'll be able to tell over time whether you are or not. I'll tell you how surprised I was with certain sports when I started doing my own bet tracking. So I think from there, that's good. But onwards and upwards, as we say, we, we might revisit this, like do another pod with Luke in six months and we'll see where he's, he's come. Yeah. And then, uh, and then by the way, he's like, oh, I'm not doing anything right. First off, number one, you didn't go bust, uh, which is like <laughs> so many people just go, oh, I lost all my money. Even like at a level where they should definitely not be losing all their money or built up. So that's number one is very positive. Number two, you're not betting sizes that are out of hand, which is great right now because you can still place a $2 bet and have fun with that for sure. Uh, and then number three is you're tracking everything, which is the most important part, right? If you track everything, you improve. If you don't track, how will you improve if you don't know where to improve? It's, it's, it's literally near impossible. It's like with anything in life, you need to know how much money am I making from this? And like, if you're running a business and you're, you know, this thing's costing you a hundred thousand, this thing's making you a hundred thousand, this thing's making you a million, then what are you going to do? You're going to put more resources to this and you're going to take away the resources from this. And why am I continuing to operate a division that's losing a hundred thousand, right? If you just relate that to sports betting, it's very simple. It's like, Hey, I continually lose at this book, continually lose on this sport. This thing's broken. Either let me fix it, plug it up, or let me stop it altogether and to more resources, right? When you talk it in terms of a business, it's easy. When you talk it in terms of sports betting, people don't want to put it the work in. I'll add one more thing, which is a positive as well. Going through that bet history, I don't see parlays in there, teasers, stuff like that. That's stuff that like, especially the parlays, that's stuff that recreational bettors get carried away with. We did an episode on parlays before. There's like this belief that you, you should never play parlays. That's not entirely true, but most of the recreational players are playing parlays to try to win a big score and it just ends up costing them their bankroll over time. So from that perspective, the majority of your stuff is straight wagers. I think that's another positive as well. Yeah, major positive. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I'm like, oh, for 75 on career parlays. It's okay. pretty bad. So you've dialed learned, it back. He's learned his lesson. He's learned, he's learned, he's learned. You're learning through experience. Good, yes. Oh, I, I like got it. spanked. <laughs> I didn't just learn. I got spanked. You've it's been a harm. spanked it's, it's not, by no, spanking. <laughs> it's, it's hard, actually, because if you, if you win a big parlay early and you constantly chase that win, right? It's like if you go to the casino yeah. your first time going and you win like 100 bucks, it's like a drug. You always want to go keep, keep coming back and chasing that 100. So, all right. I guess we can close off now. Luke, anything else to say or add? On the betting where, front. where can everyone find you right now? Yeah, go find me, lay it with Luke on uh, BetStamp. Uh, you know, we've got a strong Twitter following as well, about 107 people. So you can follow me at Luke underscore Campanella. And, uh, no, make it, you got to switch it. It's got to be lay it with Luke. Lay it with Luke or BetStamp Luke, something like that. It's got, where. Can you change your Twitter bio just at any time? Yeah, not yeah. your bio. No, you your, your, handle. Your, your handle. Yeah, can no. you change that? Zach, at any time? cut yeah. this out. This is embarrassing. This is, yeah. <laughs> this is our social media guy, by yeah. the way. Yeah, Zach, can you, cut this out. <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> no, I actually cut this out. I actually cut this out. We're not keeping this, dude. <laughs> just say, you can follow me on, on Twitter, lay it with Luke, and then just that change was, that it. That was a joke, by the way. What? What I just joking. Yeah. That's why I'm saying, like, why are we going to cut these? Making a joke. So we leaving this all in? Of course we yeah, are. Yeah, this is all staying in from start <laughs> to finish. Look, I'll throw in another joke. With the headphones on in the gamer chair right now, you look like Ninja. Like you're about to start streaming on Twitch or something like that. I'm not, I have been known to fidget too much. Although the guy who keeps calling me out every YouTube, he then commented again last one. And by the way, we read the comments, man. We don't have no shame here. It's true. I'll read every comment. I actually like to let Johnny know like whenever there's <laughs> negative comments about him, ju- just to fire him up a little bit. We, we but only that get guy's like coming 20, around. We only get like 20 comments. Though. By the way, that's not that hard what are me. the odds that, that that guy that's commenting on you is a bet stamp employee? And there's one person who's burner. It could be that I've had suspicions. <laughs> I'd say you guys. it's close to 50-50. Like I'm sa- I would say plus 100 fair line. Maybe. I don't know. I hope I hope it is. Like but he said he's coming around the last episode. He did say that. That's why that's why it's even fishier. But he puts out paragraphs when he, he does. comments. It's a, it's a weird it's a weird account. I like that guy though. Yeah, well whatever. We do read the comments, please, for those listening. We don't ask for anything. We literally never ask for anything. So just subscribe. Really ask for you guys to just download subscribe Betstamp every episode. Download Betstamp. Yeah, I guess no, we, we do that like once a month. Download Betstamp for sure. If you haven't done that already, like please just download Betstamp. But on top of that, subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
We are putting out a lot more content now. This obviously matters for us. We're trying to grow our business. If you are listening, wherever you listen to the audio of this, if you're listening to audio, just rate and review five stars. If you like the content, you enjoy it. If you don't, then don't rate it. Like just move on. But if you do, like if you're actually listening to the end of this podcast, and it's a good podcast, I enjoyed it, rate and review five stars. If you made it, it this long. It takes literally 30 seconds. I'm not going to go into like the, the Nick Costas, don't be a freeloader type of stuff, but like it's free content we're putting out there. It's kind of enjoyable. We get a lot of good feedback. Rate and review whenever you can. Follow Luke, lay it with Luke. Check out the bet stamp TikTok that Luke is running up yes, as sir. well. I listen, I'm just learning about TikTok myself. I'm a man in my mid thirties. This, I don't know what the difference between TikTok and Vine is. No idea. I always grew up on Vine. This is the exact same thing. I don't know how Vine disappeared and TikTok is here now, but hey, I'm enjoying TikTok now as well. So yeah, know. it is what it is. And, uh, you know, we're going to be putting out a lot more content as Rob said, you know, this podcast is staying for sure. And we might, you know, look at, um, putting out some stuff that may be more, uh, you know, widespread as opposed to just, you know, sharp betting content and stuff like that. So everyone, thank you for listening and watching for those on YouTube, which is not, not too many compared to the, uh, the audio. So if you want to just check it out, you got to come see what we look like. You got to come, you got to come look at the thing. And just you, give us a view. Just give us a view. Maybe you don't like the way we look and you turn it off and you never do it again, but you know. All right. Thank you everyone. And we will see you next week with a huge, big bomb banger of an episode. I promise you guys next week is going to be our best episode yet. Big bomb bangers.